Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. And welcome back to our discussion with Kenneth Katz about the Rockwell B-1B Lancer. When we left the story last time, the B-1A had just been cancelled by the Carter administration in the late 70s. But as we're here for part two, we know the story continues. So we're going to pick up straight where we left off and find out what happens next. And like all good political stories, the political sounds continue to change. So Carter runs specifically against the B1 program. Election year comes up and his opponent runs for it. I suppose looking looking back, were these defense contracts in so much of a public domain that this is as much of a vote winner or a vote loser for a politician during this period? Well, we have to go now to the late 1970s. From a purely technical point of view, the B-1 program, while not in a full-scale development mode, there is certainly a variety of testing still going on, not only with uh, the first three airplanes, but with this B-1A number four. And they're actually doing some very interesting work on the effectiveness of this new electronic countermeasure system. So that's happening out at Edwards Air Force Base. But meanwhile, in the bigger world, a variety of things are happening. As we know, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, the American public in general um, did not have a positive attitude towards military expenditures or towards confrontation with the Soviet Union. But uh, the Soviet Union didn't cooperate with that. Um, you saw, um, first of all, a very, very ambitious Soviet strategic buildup. And so people started to argue that the United States was genuinely threatened and that potentially the Soviet uh, buildup could um, disarm the United States in a, um, in a surprise attack, if you will, in nuclear Pearl Harbor, and therefore that the United States needed to increase its strategic deterrent and needed to do it quickly. In addition, you had a large amount of Soviet-sponsored aggression abroad. You saw that in Central America. You saw that in Africa. Um, and then, of course, uh, most notably, you saw that in Afghanistan. And so if in the early to mid 1970s, the general um, approach was let's give peace a chance, um, by the late 1970s, uh, many Americans had shifted to um, saying that we need to beef up our military to confront the Soviet Union, and we need to have a much more um, confrontational foreign policy with the Soviet Union. And so the 1980 presidential election um, uh, featured Jimmy Carter on, for the Democrats, who was, uh, st was still interested in an approach based on arms control. And then Ronald Reagan, who was a, um, an American uh, conservative, uh, very much a hardliner towards the Soviet Union, running on the Republican ticket. And interestingly, this is a uh, election campaign in which the B-1 um, prominently played. Uh, the B-1 was regarded by Republicans as an example of Carter's weakness, the cancellation of the B-1. And um, it was a, the kind of airplane that the Republicans said we need, because after all, it had been developed, it was still in testing. And if we want to beef up our defenses quickly, the B-1's the airplane to do it. So, so here's the situation in the late 1970s, let's say going into 1980. Um, the Air Force and its industrial partners is moving ahead with deploying cruise missiles on the B-52. The B-1 is canceled, but some level of test activity continues. And then something new pops out of the, uh, the black world. The Carter administration reveals the existence of something called the Advanced Technology Bomber, which was commonly called the Stealth Bomber, and today we would call the B-2 Spirit. And the Carter administration's argument was, why do we need the B-1? The B-1 is obsolete. It's yesterday's news. The airplane, the reason why we don't want to build the B-1 is because the, the super duper stealth um, advanced technology bombers in the wings. So those of you who want to build the B-1 are just building a, a wasteful and obsolescent aircraft. 
and um, obviously the the declassification of the B two program, um, it, it or or the declassification of its existence. Obviously, the details remain classified to this day, but the de the the the, the declassification of his existence was very much a political act. 1980 election was a, a sea change in America. It, uh, yeah, at least in American politics, it brought in uh, Ronald Reagan and, uh, and a uh, renewed emphasis on um, uh, rearming America. And so President Reagan was inaugurated in 1981, and you saw the beginning of a massive military buildup in the 1980s. In 1981, the president gave a speech when he, at, when he laid out his program for um, rearming America in terms of its nuclear deterrent force. And whereas in previous discussions had been, shall we build this or shall we build that? I think a summary of the Reagan build program was we're gonna build everything. So we're gonna build more Trident submarines with their sea launch ballistic missiles. And we're going to build the Peacekeeper missile. And we're going to beef up nuclear command control and communications. And we're going to arm, continue to arm the B-52 with cruise missiles. And we're going to build 100 B-1B models, which is to say spiffed up B-1As as an interim bomber. So we get a rapid increase in our nuclear capabilities. And in the long term, we're going to build this B-2, this advanced technology bomber. But we need to get the B-1 built as an interim because we're not going to really get the B-2 online till the 1990s. So it was a very expensive, very ambitious program, almost a uh, wartime level of buildup because of a perceived threat level from the Soviet Union. And, and so the B-1 was back in business. Of course, Congress had to appropriate the funds for it. But, uh, you know, the, the B-1 had been dead and uh, now it was back alive again. And in fact, it was a very urgent program. The focus of the B-1 program was now let's get this thing out quickly because uh, there's an urgency. And after all, if the B-1 program is going to drift along for a decade, we might as well just buy the B-2. So uh, there was enormous schedule pressure, which would have much effects on the program. So what distinguishes the B from the A? I, that, that, I know that's an incredibly broad question and we can be here for, for hours discussing it, but what's sort of the, the big ticket? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. The B-1, one obvious difference between the, the B-1B that went into production as opposed to the B-1A, which had been prototyped in the 1970s, was that it lost the ejection capsule into ejection seats. Another major change was that the airplane lost its Mach 2 capability. They decided that Flying at Mach 2 wasn't that important, but that stealth really was important. And while the B-1B would never have the low radar cross-section of, say, a B-2, which was designed for the mission, even the B-1A had a much lower cross-section than the B-1, than the B-52 that preceded it. So the B-1B had a much lower radar cross-section than the B-1A um, because uh, much of the radar cross-section of the B-1 came from its engine inlets. They redesigned the engine inlets to be stealthy, and it probably reduced by 90% the radar cross-section of the B-1B relative to the B-1A. However, uh, those new engine inlets couldn't support supersonic flight. So that, that's, that's one set of changes. Um, when you have a lower radar cross-section, it makes the job of the electronic countermeasures easier. Now, remember also that the, the, one of the things that the B-1A test program had been doing in the late 1970s was continuing to look at this electronic countermeasures when B-1A number four was uh, delivered. So uh, because the threat is constantly evolving with Soviet enemy air defenses, the B-1B got a, uh, a, 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 an upgraded avionics system, both offensively and defensively. Also, electronics technology was advancing. Now, yet another area was that, in some ways, if you can't beat them, join them. The B-1B was designed as a cruise missile carrier. Now, originally, of course, the B-1A had been a penetrating bomber. It was going to penetrate Soviet air defenses. But um, the B-1B had both penetration capability and cruise missile capability. And as a result, the gross weight of the airplane was upgraded. It went from 395,000 pounds to 477,000 pounds. That's a 
big. That's 82,000 pounds. That's a big percentage of the weight. So that would slow it down for Mark II anyways, wouldn't it? Well, weight so much doesn't have to do with it. It does affect the, the performance of the airplane. It also affected another thing. In order to generate more lift because you're heavier, you either have to go faster or you have to fly at a higher angle of attack. If you're going to fly at a higher angle of attack, remember that the airplane is unstable in pitch naturally. So the, uh, the flight control system needed to be upgraded in order to handle the um, higher weights without going unstable. So um, the, you also got, for example, a new radar. The B-1B definitely had a family. I mean, it was a B-1. I mean, if you put a B-1A and a B-1B next to each other, you have to be a real aviation geek to tell the difference between them. However, while there was a, still obviously a very strong family resemblance, there were, uh, there were many, many changes between the B-1B and the B-1A. It was a much more effective airplane reflecting another generation of technology. When does the aircraft start to see service? Because it's entry to service comes reasonably quickly in the terms of aircraft development these days, but, but it doesn't go as smoothly as, as one would hope. No. Um, remember that there was an imperative for speed here and, um, they needed to, the whole rationale for the airplane was it was an interim way of, uh, improving America's nuclear deterrent capability quickly because there was an urgent need. So, the program was started in 1981. Um, they imme almost immediately started flight testing it. And you would say, well, how could they do that? Because they didn't even have an airplane yet. Well, they were very clever. They took two of the B1As, B1A number two and B1A number four, and they fitted them with various B1B systems. So you were effectively flying these systems and flight testing them before the first B1B was actually ever built. They also took the radar and they put it in an old BAC-111 airliner and they started flying that around so you could get flight hours on the radar before the airplane was ever flying. Very clever. Who, who would have thought that the 111 actually had a decent use other than making a lot of noise and smoke? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a very slight personal connection with that. Um, in the 1980s, I was a young Air Force officer out at Edwards Air Force Base and I got to fly on the BAC-111 with carrying the B-1B's radar. And uh, it was a very impressive radar, it really was. I noticed you didn't say that about the aircraft. <laughs> you know, it was one time with the airplane. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was a fun little airplane, but uh, it was a very impressive mm -hmm. radar. The first B-1B actually flew in 1984. Now, if you're familiar with time spans in the aerospace industry, the program gets the go ahead in 1981. You know, you got to go through all the business of getting Congress to appropriate money and get the contract signed. You flew the first B1 in the summer of night, B1B in summer of 1984. How'd they do that that quickly? Well, this is how they did that that quickly. Remember I said that there, uh, there were three B1A uh, pre-production aircraft, B1A number four, number uh, five, and number six. And when it was canceled, they said, okay, we're going to uh, continue to complete number B1A number four as a electronic countermeasures test bed. And we're not going to build number five and number six. But what they did do was they took the pieces of number five and put them off in a corner. B1A number five suitably reworked became the basis of B1B number one. So B1B number one was kind of a one-off hybrid. That's how they could get it built in 1984. It was a flight test aircraft that would never see operational service. But that flew in the summer of 1984. The airplane itself was, um, the first airplane was delivered to the Strategic Air Command in 1985 for test for training purposes and the airplane had initial operational capability in 1986. So that's an extraordinarily compressed time span if you look at that compared to most military aircraft of, of that level of complexity. And the question is how they do it. And the way that they did it was they adopted a policy, a, a program approach called concurrency. Concurrency says that we will um, simultaneously flight test, manufacture, and introduce into operation the aircraft at the same time. 
Now, that's a way to get stuff into service quickly. You're doing everything at the same time, but, but that also led to a whole boat of problems. So let's, let's talk through some of the problems that you had. Normal approach would be that, let's say the flight test program might get aircraft one, two, three, and four, but the flight test program only got number one and two, three, four, et cetera, went straight to strategic air command. The next airplane that the flight test program got was number nine. That meant that flight testing had to proceed with a fairly small number of airplanes. You had B1A number two, which crashed in the summer of 1984. So that was uh, off the books. You had B1A number four, you had B1B number two, you had this BAC 111, and then you had some ground test facilities and what have you. But clearly the testing was going to be strung out because you didn't have enough test assets because you were moving stuff to uh, the operational fleet. Now, that also meant that the operational airplane that the Strategic Air Command was receiving was not a fully tested airplane. It was an airplane that uh, obviously the test force out at Edwards Air Force Base needed to do just enough testing so that Strategic Air Command could do some flight training. But the airplane did not have its full capabilities. And of course, if you're introducing it into operations at the same time, then you're introducing an airplane that had very limited capabilities. And first, the airplane that went operational in 1986 was in fact barely capable of doing a mission. It was almost more of a symbolic thing of, yes, we, um, we said we were going to do this in 1986 and lo and behold, we're going to do it in 1986. But the airplane had a whole boatload of, of deficiencies and unproven capabilities. When you have a concurrency pro uh, program, you also have lots of other things. It means that since you're developing and manufacturing the airplane at the same time, as you learn more in testing, you have to retrofit the airplanes that have already been delivered with the improvements. That means that you have multiple configurations out in, in the service. They were also doing things like they were sometimes short of parts. So they would deliver an airplane to the field and they would say, okay, we delivered the airplane, check. Then they would proceed to remove systems from it and fly them back to the factory and put them on the next airplane. So the airplane developed a uh, reputation as an airplane that had a lot of deficiencies. I mean, it did have a lot of deficiencies. In fairness, those deficiencies were sorted out pretty well. And by, uh, let's say, 1990 or 91, the airplane was actually a very capable airplane. The biggest, I mean, there were deficiencies uh, across the board, and I could spend, in fact, I've written a book about those deficiencies. But yeah, the we, want, biggest, we want people to buy the book. So we, we, that's we right. <laughs> The biggest problem was with the electronic countermeasures system, um, and which was really critical to its uh, the, the effectiveness of the airplane, and and that took quite a while to straighten out. And in fact, was never fully straightened out. Although certainly by let's say 1990 or so, the system was much more effective. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello there, I'm Matthew Moss from Fighting on Film, the podcast for war movie fans. From the beaches of Normandy to the days of chivalry and swords, if it's been captured on film, we aim to cover it. Featuring top guests from the world of entertainment, historians and industry insiders, we bring you a unique look at the films from our favourite genre. Listen wherever you find your podcasts or find us at fightingonfilm.com. And we're back with Kenneth Katz and our discussion about the B-1B Lancer. And it's this interesting point that as the aircraft is getting fighting fit, the enemy that it's being made fighting fit for suddenly doesn't exist anymore. That's right. The Soviet Union went away in 1991. And in 1991, President Bush, the first President Bush, said that we were going to pull all of our bombers off of alert. So we're not going to have them sitting there armed up with nuclear weapons, ready crews standing by, ready to go at a moment's notice because the Cold War was over. So the B-1 got fixed up just in time for it to lose its mission. And there was an interesting question. What do we do with this thing now? We just spent somewhat north of $20 billion. And this is back when $20 billion was real money. Um, we just spent somewhat north of $20 billion to, to, to build this magnificent airplane. We've got a hundred of them. They finally work pretty well. And now we don't have a mission for them. What should we do with them? In addition, remember that, that the, um, in the aftermath of the cold war, 
Americans wanted what we called the peace dividend. We'd been spending a lot of money on the Cold War. Let's let's stop spending all that money on the Cold War and let's throw a party. So some people said, maybe we just ought to uh, park these B1s out in the desert and and um, you know, um, doing it, but but that didn't seem like a very good way of of handling our investment. And in some ways, the question of what to do with the B one was answered by one Saddam Hussein. Now, the B one did not play a role in Operation Desert Storm when um, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. The reason is for several reasons. First of all, we still had at that time a residual nuclear deterrent mission. Um, it hadn't quite ended yet in uh, early 1981. In addition, for part of Desert Storm, B-1 um, had been grounded because of engine problems. And the B-52s, in fact, could take care of whatever bomber needs were needed. However, it was obvious, or Saddam Hussein made it obvious, that although the Cold War was over, there were still national security challenges. And um, they would be more unpredictable and more far flung than the Cold War environment that we had been in. And people said, well, wouldn't it be helpful if we had a long range bomber that the next time Saddam Hussein or one of the other similar type regimes uh, invaded a neighbor or misbehaved that we could rapidly respond? And a long range bomber made a lot of sense in that situation. So people started to think, hey, the B-1 always had had some small level of conventional capability. And particularly the B-1B was not an exclusively nuclear bomber. But what if we develop that capability? The other thing, as people looked out a little bit longer, was they said the Gulf War in 1991 had proven that precision guided munitions were here and they were orders of magnitude more effective. What if we turn the B-1 into a precision long range strike aircraft? And so the 1990s were a decade of transformation for the B-1. First of all, the, the entire US Air Force was reorganized. No longer was there a strategic air command. There was something called an air combat command and the B-1 was assigned to the air combat command. And a over the decade, the B-1 and the, the B-1 community, the B-1, of course, is just an inanimate object, um, uh, re-rolled themselves from being a um, nuclear bomber. In fact, the B-1 lost the last vestiges of its nuclear mission in 1997. And it became first a long-range conventional strike aircraft. There was, for example, in 1995, the around-the-world flight called Coronet Bat, where the B-1 uh, a pair of B-1s flew around the world nonstop, of course, refueled and dropped bombs in multiple places, which showed that a B-1 could basically drop a bomb anywhere. That was a uh, that was a, an important demonstration. And then what you started to see was the um, equipping of the B-1 with the uh, Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDAM, GPS Guided Bombs. And so by the, um, in 1998, you saw the first combat use of the B-1. It was against Iraq. Um, uh, Saddam Hussein's regime was misbehaving. And so we had Operation Desert Fox. The B-1 just dropped some conventional bombs, but it was its first um, operational bombing mission. In 1999, um, um, we had um, a, a NATO intervention in the former Yugoslavia, and the B-1 played a uh, significant role. Um, it was a long-range airplane. It could carry a lot of weapons. It had, again, it wasn't yet conventional, um, armed with conventional precision guided munitions, but it could drop dumb bombs very accurately because of its radar and navigation system. And so the B-1 really transformed itself. It was a new world for the B-1. And then um, um, the attacks of 9-11 happened, and the B-1 spent the next 20 years in a series of combats that had nothing to do with what it was designed to do, but it turned out to be a very highly effective airplane. Um, it's an interesting story because this was an airplane that was meant to fight the Soviet Union in, in a nuclear war. And what it ended up being really good at was this long range, high endurance, very flexible, very responsive conventional strike platform that was used for both planned attacks and also uh, heavily for close air support uh, of, of troops in contact on the ground. It was used that way uh, first in Afghanistan and then in Iraq. It uh, was used uh, when we uh, intervened in Libya with our NATO allies 
about a decade ago, and then it was heavily used against ISIS. And um, I think that the B-1B can rightfully be said to be amongst the most effective U.S. combat aircraft um, in its era. Your book opens with the, the is it Coast, Coast, Coast incident where B-1 su supported a special ops team on the ground by flying very low and very loud. It grabs your attention because, and I'm going to be honest here, I wasn't expecting that on the first page of your book, that this big strategic bomber, you're going to open the story of it by it flying a mission profile that it seems counterintuitive. But that just sort of shows how good an aircraft it was that it's been able to survive all of these different periods in its life and be able to continue to be of in, in importance right down to, to now. It's turned out to be a very flexible and adaptive weapon system that can do a lot of things um, other than what it was primarily designed to do, if you will, 50 plus years ago. I think there, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, an airplane that can that has a lot of range and a lot of payload um, can simply be used for a lot of different things. An airplane whose systems are based on digital electronics can essentially be reprogrammed. And, and mm -hmm. that makes it a very flexible airplane. Um, I think another attribute of the B-1 that makes it very flexible is that it has a crew of four people. If you have a fighter airplane that has one person, that's a lot. There can be a lot of workload for one person. But if you have four people on board, that means you can have one person flying the airplane, one person talking to people on the ground to a forward air controller with troops that are in contact, one person who's uh, getting the bombs program to support them, and one person who's, say, coordinating with uh, the B-1 hitting a tanker airplane so it can get a load of fuel and continue to support for the next uh, four hours. So... Um, that that crew of four turns out to be uh, very valuable. Um, it gives the airplane a lot of ability to respond to a dynamic situation. And that's quite different than what the airplane was designed for because, because nuclear warfare was, was governed by a very rigid plan. Uh, the reason why you had to have a rigid plan is, first of all, you didn't want to have a lot of freelancing and, and initiative with uh, thermonuclear war. But second of all, if you were going to have various missiles and bombers attacking the Soviet Union, you had to deconflict them. You didn't want to have a B-1 fly through a mushroom cloud that had been, you know, a, a nuclear warhead that had been detonated by a missile five minutes beforehand. So everything had to be synchronized and planned, and the focus was on following the plan. In this new world that the B-1 was flying in, there was no plan. The plan was this, take off with a full load of weapons and a full load of fuel, go into some orbit over Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or wherever, and wait till we call you. And, and that kind of environment, it turned out that the B-1 was very well equipped to do. So what's the future for the aircraft? The, you know, the future is, again, stealth, stealth bomber. We've got the, the B-21 radar on the horizon but the B-1 is still still in operation and will be for, what, another 10 years, I suppose? Roughly. The B-1 yeah. is an old airplane at this point. Um, it's just chronologically an old airplane. You're talking about airplanes that were delivered now uh, roughly 35 years ago. So it's chronologically old. The airplane's been used heavily you know, in, in 20 years of, of combat. Remember that that the B-1 was designed as a strategic air command bomber, which is to say it would sit on the ground on alert and then fly the occasional training mission. That was its profile. But it was used day in and day out for two decades. So the airplanes are structurally worn out. In fact, there are only 45 of them left in service as of today. What they've done is cull out the early, the early deliveries and then they went through all the remaining airplanes and they said some of these airplanes are just too structurally damaged, too fatigued at this point to uh, economically repair. So we're down to 45 airplanes, which are still first line combat aircraft. But the current plan is to re replace them with the Northrop Grumman B-21 Raider. And uh, that should happen sometime over the next decade. And uh, sometime in the 2030s, probably the last B-1 will fly. What a remarkable story for an aircraft that originally was, if it was to be called to be used, wasn't expected to 
come back given the nature of the war it was going to fight and now it's been on constant use for as you're saying for, for 20 years it, that is a testament to that original design and the the teams at north american and, and rockwell that were able to build something that would turn out to be as flexible as it has been it's a it's an extraordinary airplane and um i think that the reason why it's been an extraordinary airplane is because of the people who've been associated with it, the people who design the airplane, the people who have maintained the airplane, I think. And if you had to pick one group, it might very well be the people who've maintained the airplane. It's a very maintenance intensive airplane and they've made it happen. You have the people who continue to modernize the airplane, the people who've flown the airplane. Um, it really is a, a the, the B1 community is a special community. And um, I've enjoyed, I've met many, many members of it as I've been working on this book. And uh, it's, uh, they, they've made the airplane what it is. And dear listener, the book has got the most amazing selection of photographs in it. I think your publishers have done a fantastic job because it's, as I was saying to you, when, when I sent the notes over, I've, I hope these questions are okay because I've been distracted by the pictures because it's a very lovely airplane to look at. And there's lots of pictures to look at this very lovely airplane in, in your book. Thank you. Thank you. I put a lot of effort into the pictures. Um, the pictures are from multiple sources. Um, various people, members of the B1 community have uh, on my behalf have raided their closets and <laughs> pulled out extraordinary pictures, um, things that have never been seen before. And I don't mean that in a classified sense. They've just, they've just been buried in the back of people's uh, drawers for, for decades. And then I proceeded to spend a small fortune getting them professionally scanned. And that shows up in the book. More recently, of course, you have um, pictures from the National Archives. Um, you have pictures from the U.S. Air Force. The Air Force very generously allowed me to uh, visit uh, Dias Air Force Base, which is home of one of the two B-1 wings. I did a lot of photography there and they, they um, facilitated some pretty cool shots, um, you know, getting up on in places that you normally can't get up and things. So there's some very nice photography there. Um, I, I, uh, they also allowed me to fly the B-1 simulator, um, oh, wow. which was, uh, which was an extraordinary experience. I'm a, I, uh, I'm not a military pilot by background. However, I'm an experienced general aviation pilot and to move from flying a 2000 pound Piper Archer to a 400,000 pound B B1B <laughs> um, in the simulator was a, uh, was an experience. By the way, it's a very complicated and fast airplane, but it happens to be a very nice flying airplane. So yes, but the, the photography is certainly a strong point of the book and I put a lot of effort into it and I appreciate your kind words. It's a fascinating tale and there's so much, I don't want to say intrigue, but just the, the, the environment in which the aircraft was developed. There's so many different tales, you know, we've, we've talked a lot and there's still so much more to, to delve into, especially around those, as we were saying before, the avionics side, the, the, the different approaches that we're taking to it. It's a superb book. Thank you. I just want to thank Ken Katz once again for joining me here on the Damcasters. His book, The Supersonic Bone, A Development and Operational History of the B-1 Bomber, really is a fascinating read and the detail he goes to, especially on the electronics and the warfighting capability of the aircraft, is superb. Like we were saying, the photos are stunning. It really, really is an excellent piece of work. You, of course, can buy the book now. It's available in all good and evil bookshops. In the UK, it's published by Pen and Sword. In the States, by Casemate. Of course, if you're in the UK, you can get the book at the Boney Abroad Bookshop. If you click the link below, you'll be taken to our bookshop where 10% of every purchase goes to supporting the podcast. And of course, bookshop.org supports local and independent bookshops in the UK as well. If you've liked the podcast, maybe you'd consider joining us on Patreon, where we have lots of fun things going on. You can get bit of merch at some of the tiers. Everybody gets a hand scrolled thank you postcard from me. It's designed by the wonderful Mark Waters at aircraft.co.uk. There's a Discord channel where we can chat all things aviation related and it keeps us going, which is amazing. The simplest thing you can do is review the podcast, tell your friends, let us know what's going on. 
If you're interested in the Patreon thing, there's a link in the description or head to patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters, all one word, and you can have a look for yourself. Thank you for your support. And until next time, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com. <laughs>